Hello everybody. As we continue our exploration of the environmental humanities, we now turn to two significant components, ecological criticism and its critique of development and ecofeminism. By way of introduction, let me look at what these imply. Ecological criticism of development and the project of modernity looks at things such as the growth rate, urban progress, modernization and industrialization and the kinds of economies it has generated which have been invariably unfavorable to the environment. For instance, human development and its nuclearization or the chemical dependent agriculture. Ecofeminism, on the other hand, focuses on a very specific aspect of ecological uh, thought and that is the link between gender and the environment. So, what does the ecological critique of development or modernization or modernity mean? Take a look at the two excerpts up there for you. Margaret Atwood's The Year of the Flood, one of the Mad Adam trilogy, and quote from the F Denzel Washington film Book of Eli. Both of these look at and document things like greed, human greed, and what it has achieved. For ecological critics, much of human development has been about greed, about excessive production and excessive consumption, both of which have led to environmental damage, in most cases irreversible. So the construction of big dams, nuclearization, chemical develop, uh, de uh, dependent agriculture are not viable. Uh, there's an excerpt there from Arunati Roy's major essay, The Greater Common Good. The political economy of development as documented from the rise of industrialization in Europe, 18th century downwards, globalization and its outcomes now, notes that the kind of development agenda in most nations has been detrimental to the environment for perhaps eternity. E ecological economics has three focus areas. It looks at sustainable scale, equitable distribution and efficient allocation. It notes that social externalities such as uh, prestige economies, peer pressure are also linked to market and demand. It assumes that as in nature and organisms, economy and economic progress is not endless. It at some point will stop and then we have to sustain it. Now, industrialization has resulted in the necessity of building huge dams. Uh, what is the human cost of big dams? If you take a look at the statistics published by the World Commission on Dams reported in The Guardian and uh, it's up there for you on one of the slides, 40 to 80 million people around the world have been displaced due to big dams and there's a list up there. They have had also cost overruns and they are of course ecologically severely damaging. After we think in terms of ecological economics, we have to turn because of the necessity of addressing catastrophe, Ulrich Beck's 1992 thesis of a risk society that Beck proposed that we, that we live within modernity, but modernity which is defined and redefined as a risk society was a radical departure from traditional social theory. Beck argues that organizations and governments admit, assess and build risks into their very planning. That is, risks are calculated, documented and anticipated in the, in the process of modernization itself. In other words, what we are looking at is an extraordinary thesis, which someone like Zygmunt Bauman will build on. Industrial disasters, Bhopal, Chernobyl and others, are not incidental to modernity, they are integral to it. In other words, what we are looking at here is modernization and modernity, industrialization and development have built into them risk, risk to certain segments of society. And that's where Bauman makes his important intervention in modernity and its outcasts. Bauman argues that modernization progresses through the production of waste, through humans organized, categorized as waste. People become excess to the process. They become socially irrelevant, unemployable, and they are penalized. So modernity develops, builds, and accumulates waste. Let's turn briefly and quickly to the question of waste. What is waste? Waste is the product of time, people argue. It comes at the end of a process. It's a matter, of course, also of values being assigned to certain objects. That is, what constitutes waste changes over a period of time. Waste is integral to human life, but what is important is human life itself is sometimes rendered waste. Waste is the result of categorization. It's both material and ethical social. We now have a field called waste or discard studies often combined under the category or rubric critical discard studies. It looks at social practices of exclusion, purification of humans, spaces and other life forms. It looks at health and sickness and economic relationships, 
So, since waste, discard, trash are all the results of modernization and modernity, we have to examine, as we have been arguing, the forms, the cultural constructions, the discourses through which certain segments of life forms, certain kinds of life forms are deemed to be excessive, of no value and therefore can be exterminated. As we examine ecological concepts and environmental ethics in these literary cultural texts, we come to know, discover that over a period of centuries, humanity has always linked species together. So, vermin, when we use a category like vermin, we have merged various species into the category vermin or rodent that is deemed to be inferior, frightening, dirty and therefore of no value. This instrumental view of species is studied best also in terms of humans and gender. Ecofeminism focuses on the gendered links between modernity and development, discourses and material, material realities. Ecofeminism notes that both nature and women are represented as resources. They are resources to be commanded and used by the male for his use, abuse or sometimes overuse. So, if waste and discard is the assignation of value to life forms and non-living non forms on earth, then ecofeminism says nature has been evaluated in a certain way, so is the woman. The qualities associated with nature is often as interchangeable with the qualities associated with women. Nurture, care, reproduction, gentle behavior, tolerance and passivity are all associated with nature and they are associated with women. So, ecofeminism argues that patriarchy and class relations make the distinction between nature and culture to suit their purposes. Women are deemed to be matter and conversely men deemed to be all mind. But both women and nature are subject to control for purposes that suit the men. Science has been used to control women including the reproductive rights. People like Caroline Merchant, Vandana Shiva, Sarah Franklin and Donna Haraway have, have repeatedly drawn attention to the fact that technology and science have invariably, inevitably dominated nature and in the process dominated women. Um, within ecofeminism, this material strand, often called materialist ecofeminism, focuses on issues that are raging even now. Wage, labor, the organization and its hierarchies are all subject to material uh, feminists for this particular reason that gender roles, gender traits are socially constructed and not natural. Um, for material ecofeminists, this has larger implications. So, for instance, uh, materialist ecofeminists wonder at questions of agricultural labor, who is in charge, how much do they, are they paid and things like that. Ecofeminists argue also that in many traditional cultures such as African or Asian or South American, this gender division also has something else within it. And this is the reverential, worshipful attitudes towards nature. This strand of ecofeminism called spiritualist ecofeminism argues that nature can be worshipped and there is an intrinsic link between humanity and nature. They tend to suggest that there is something like a spirit in the woods or a presence in the woods which is not necessarily human and not necessarily divine but somewhere in between and this therefore is not something you can overlook. Ecofeminist criticism focuses on stereotypes of nature and women but it also looks at positive elements such as the ecological consciousness and I just spoke about uh, spiritualist ecofeminism. It looks at uh, ecological consciousness that emphasizes interconnectedness of life forms but of living and non-living forms on earth as well. Increasingly aware of the fact that science and technology are imbued with western thinking and western ideological positions, there is a valorization of traditional non-western models of nature. Spiritual models just like as I just said are part of this as well. Um, if you look at the text put up there, you will see for instance the Emily Dickinson poem which says, nature the gentlest mother is impatient of no child the feeblest or the waywardest had admonition mild. Look at what Dickinson is saying here. Nature is equated with mother first and this mother is tolerant, responsible, always passive, quiet and not subject to tempers and things like that. The all forgiving mother, the all forgiving nature are interchangeable in what Dickinson is doing here. This stereotyping bestows the quality of nature 
upon women, thereby naturalizing the feminine, but also feminizes nature. Let's recap quickly by way of a conclusion. As environmental humanities turns its attention to industrialization, urban studies, uh, labor relations, organizations, and the social world of humanity, it notes that species, life forms with intraspecies relations and interspecies relations are all constructions performed through discourses by humanity. This results in the evaluation of all species in terms of what they can do or how they can benefit man. This means there is a hierarchization of life forms, there is an instrumentalization of life forms leading to some life forms being described or consigned to the category waste or discards. Trash cultures, discards are the natural outcome of the process of modernization. In other words, we have to assume that risk and waste are not aberrations but integral to how modernity and modernization proceed. One adjacent link to this would be ecofeminist critiques, specifically the materialist one, which also notes that nature and, and, and the woman have both been treated as sources, resources, things to be used by man, their values determined by man, their functions and characteristics also determined by man. So environmental humanities here is particularly keen on locating what is called speciesism and the resultant forms of discriminatory practices within them. By way of a conclusion and summarizing of what we have said so, so far today, ecological critiques of development pay attention to the fact that waste is integral to modernization and modernity. Waste is the assigning of values to processes, people, things. Some objects are consigned to the category waste or discard. They might be excessive as in they are the result of excesses, hyperproduction and hyperconsumption or they might be things that have lost their quote unquote value. For people like Zygmunt Bowman, Ulrich Beck, both risk and waste are integral to the process of modernity. That as modernization proceeds, there are things, processes and people who will get marginalized in the process. They become modernity's outcasts, as Bauman famously put it. While we continue this exploration of development and the project of modernity and resultant waste, uh, ecofeminism draws attention to the fact that women have been treated as part of this process in solely instrumental frames. That is, by stereotyping women and nature, man has been able to assert total oppressive control over both. Qualities of the natural world have been bestowed upon the woman. The woman's qualities translated into so-called natural qualities. So as we think about ecofeminism as a critical approach to literature and culture, we discover that this stereotyping is part of a much larger um, anthropocentric view of the world, which also contains within it both patriarchy and speciesism. Thank you.